Hi guys, Rob from Royal Balls. Um, the first clutch of babies has shed out and we're going to set them up today. Um, this is my hatchling rack tucked away in the corner and I've pre-prepared some tubs but I'm going to show you how we set the, uh, the babies up and we're going to get a close look at them because I've got some really pretty babies to show you. So, let's get after it. Okay guys, this is the clutch. Um, they were incubated just for information at uh, 88.5 and the first pipper was on day 59. I cut the eggs on day 59, the rest of the clutch, and on day 60 all of the babies were out of the eggs. They'd fully absorbed the yolk sac and they weren't trailing any umbilicus. They were ready to come out at, uh, at day 60. This is now uh, 10 days on from the hatch date and they've all shed out again just for reference time scale uh, most of the babies shed out on day nine the rest of the babies on day ten so i'm going to set them up in their individual tubs now um, i did sex them earlier um, the tub setup itself is very very simple it's a daiso tub and you'll see that it's quite small the setup is very simple it's just a couple of sheets of newspaper and a water bowl the water bowl is a daiso ceramic water bowl Uh, very, very cheap from Daiso there, um, so they will all have their own individual uh, fresh water. And each of the tubs is individually labelled with a number and also some details about the snake itself. Um, I'm not really big into these uh, Clutch 1 um, code stuff because I'm, I'm pretty old and my eyesight's bad so I like to use uh, a simple number like that and I keep records in a book for what they are but they are labeled here as I said I've pre-sexed the snakes but I will show you uh, one of the the males and um, when you put this tub in the rack it also shows at a glance which of the snakes uh, are which of the tubs are occupied and which of the tubs are not so they get a water bowl. You'll notice that they're not going to get a hide. And I do have hides. I've got various size hides here. I will only give them a hide if they need a hide. So this will fit in here quite nicely. And as the snake grows, um, that just about fits. But um, this is really for a bigger tub. The problem with putting a hide in any of the tubs is the snakes like to sit on top of the the hide, not inside the hide, and sometimes when you're trying to take the uh, slide the, the tubs out of their racks, if the snake is sitting on top of the hide, it can sometimes jam against the snake's body. So um, that's something to watch out for when you put hides in. Um, these have lids. The uh, hatchling rack is just an IKEA rack, uh, so there are lids on these racks here, and they just clip. I've never had a snake get out of those, uh, so. That's the setup, guys. I'll put some water in for the first guy. Before we look at the snakes, let me just show you the father. This is a four gene animal, bred to a normal, so there are just four genes. So we can see all of the genes here in the father. He is a banana. He's also pastel, and you can see that from the very, very light coloration and he's Enchi Warmer. Uh, warmer is, uh, I'll show you one of the babies, is a straight warmer, so I'll show you what that does. But you can see the pattern reduction. Enchi is normally a very strong uh, banded pattern, but the warmer actually breaks that up. So you can see some of the banding here is actually broken up. So the, uh, the Enchi doesn't show quite as strongly, but you can see in his head stamp that he does have the Enchi eye stripes which join up at the back here. The head is very very pale, the head stamp is being influenced by the uh, pastel, uh, but you can see that the head stripe just behind his, e his, his eyes here joins up at the back of the, the head which is characteristic of Enchi. You also see that he's got green eyes. So that's the father, four genes at play, they're all co-dominant genes and you will know from our genetics videos that when you have four co-dominant genes, each of the genes has a 50% chance of showing up in the babies. And so 
with four genes at play it's half a 50% times a half times a half which is actually a 16th or 6.25% chance of any of the combinations that's a one gene animal, two gene animal, three or four gene animal all have the same odds of occurring in the clutch and you'll have to watch my video to figure out how that works but um, it's just as easy to get a normal as it is to get a four gene animal in this clutch. So let's put the male away and we look at some of the babies as we rehouse them in their tubs. So baby number one is a uh, just a straight warmer. Um, 73 grams this one weighed when it hatched. This is a female and this is just a single gene warmer and you can see it differs from the spider in that the dorsal striping is not as continuous and you've also got a different head stamp and the blushing on the sides of the warmer is not as strong as in the spider I do have a spider to compare this with so let me just put him back in the tub a second and we'll pull out a spider just so that you can actually clearly see the difference this is a spider um, this animal is actually a year old, it was hatched last year, and this was a twin. There were two snakes in one egg. One was a banana, which was a male, and this was a female spider. And she weighed 22 grams when she hatched. And I wasn't sure she was going to make it, but you can see that she's perfectly fine. She is a little undersized for a year old snake, but she's eating just fine. So when you compare her to the warmer, look at the back pattern. You see the continuous line along the back, which the warmer does not have. The warmer pattern is much more reduced and the dorsal striping is not as strong. But the colour is very similar. And you can see the, the head stamps on both of them, are very distinctive head stamps. So apart from the striping and the lesser high white sides, they are actually very, very similar. So let me just put this little spider girl back. So this is the single gene warmer. It's a female. So we'll put her in her tub. We won't give her a hide unless she refuses to eat. If she refuses to eat, we'll try putting a, a hide in there for her. Um, but generally speaking, I try to avoid doing that unless they absolutely need it. You'll see that the uh, hatchling rack is actually a quite tight space in there. I like to use these smaller size tubs initially for the babies they're quite tight but I do find that the babies uh, start to eat a little bit easier um, if they feel more secure in the smaller tubs so that's the reason for the small tubs they will stay in here until they uh, they grow out of it and then I'll move them up to a slightly larger tub so we just set this one up this is number two this one is if I can find it in here single gene pastel this is also a female. This is actually quite a nice pastel. You can see that the pattern is very, very busy. The head is slightly blushed. The lips are white at the front there on the snout. And the sides are also orange. Not all pastels have this very high contrast and again blushing in the dorsal you can see the the blushing so that's just a straight pastel that's what we're looking for in a pastel this is quite a nice pastel um, it will dull with age unfortunately whilst a lot of these snakes look really bright and colorful now as they get older uh, some of them do tend to to dull out a little bit so that's a little female pastel. Let me just put her into her top and stick her in the rack. Number 
three. Oh, the pastel was 72 grams when uh, when it hatched out. Um, we look now at my favourite snake. This is again a female. This is a two gene animal. This is the pastel warmer. This hatched out at 73 grams. It is a female. I thought at first this may have Enchi in it, but I don't think it has. So the pastel, you can see the pastel has really blushed out the head. But you can see on the sides there, the eye stripe is not, uh, is not thicker at the back. So whilst there is some banding in the pattern, I don't think this has Enchi in it. This is just a pastel warmer. You can see the warmer coming through in the blushing, uh, the white sides here and the warmer coming through in the in the side pattern here you can see that beautiful side pattern much more reduced than just the straight pastel the pastel has actually brought some pattern back into the warmer you can see it's got a nice yellow dorsal but that head that head stamp is just absolutely awesome so i think this is just the two gene animal this is the pastel warmer So we'll put her into our tub, give her some water. And that's baby number three. Okay, the next baby we're going to look at is clearly a banana. And I believe that this does actually have Enchi in it. I thought at first it might just be a banana. When it first hatched out, I thought it was banana enchi, and then I changed my mind. But you can see on the head, the eye stripe at the side is much, much wider at the back, and the head stamp is, I think you can just about see a butterfly head stamp in there, plus the heavy banding, and also no alien heads here. So the enchi has cleaned up the snake really nicely. It's very, very bright, bright yellow blushing on the dorsal here and this is a little male let me see if I can I did just check the sex earlier so we do just if you can zoom in there you can see the red hemipenes coming out there there on each side so that's a that's a male the uh, banana that fathered the clutch was a, a male maker, so I did expect all the bananas would be male. This is a really, really bright coloured snake. I really like this one. And let's just put him side by side to one of the other babies. This is a pastel enchi, which we're going to have a look at in a moment, but you'll see the similarity in the back pattern. And this one clearly is enchi, which also makes me think that this is banana enchi. But I will be um, getting confirmation of both the sexes and the, uh, the ID of the snakes. It's always good to, uh, to get a second opinion. But look how bright and vibrant that is. Especially compared to his father. Because there's no pastel in this one. So there's no pastel to wash out the colour. So you see the really bright yellows and oranges down the side. Awesome. Really pretty snake. So I think that's a banana enchi. We'll put him in his tub. Give him some water. Put him back in the rack. And now that the babies have shed out, um, you can see the moist paper towel here and the sheds are still uh, very, very moist because I kept the snakes uh, moist but now that they've had their first shed there's no need to do that uh, we just put them on a straight uh, paper substrate with um, looking at my humidity monitor right now 66% relative humidity here in the room so there's no need to add any extra humidity um, the banana enchi was actually the biggest snake in the clutch he weighed 74 grams and now we're going to look at the smallest snake in the clutch this is banana warmer this guy weighed 66 grams, so he is the smallest baby. And this again is a beautiful coloured snake. So no pastel in this, just banana, and this time warmer. 
So you can see the pattern is very, very different compared to the Enchi, where the pattern is thick and heavily banded. This guy isn't. It's got the same pattern as the as the warmer. I'll just try and unwrap him a little bit. Most of these baby snakes are a little bit reluctant to um, to open themselves up. They are extremely defensive. They're very small. Look at the head stamp on this guy. You see the orange in there. And the sides of this guy are really, really bright orange. You see that? That is just awesome. Beautiful snake. And again, bananas as they age tend to get freckles, but uh, you'll notice that the father wasn't uh, very freckled. He's quite clean. And he produces babies which are also quite clean. That may be the... Uh, Enchi influence in some of the bananas, so we may see some freckles coming out in this one, but um, I think this is going to stay nice and clean. So again, a little boy, a little male. He is the smallest of the clutch. And you'll notice that um, when they came out of the egg, they had fully absorbed their yolk sac now that they've shed as well, but you can see that there's a uh, very little trace of where the umbilicus was attached. This is a snake's belly button right here. So that's where the umbilicus was attached and that's where they absorbed their yolk sac. Now that they've shed out they have fully absorbed their reserves inside their bodies so these little guys are now good to go. So we'll put him in his tub, give him some water This is uh, 70 grams, this is a female again, and this is a pastel Enchi. And what I'm looking for in the Enchi, if I can just get it to uncurl, it doesn't want to uncurl, but you can see that the, the head, the top of the head there, has the classic butterfly head stamp so you've got like a four leaf clover so these are the wings of the butterfly four wings of the butterfly on the head and the eye stripe you can see thickens up towards the back and tries to join up with the neck stripe behind the head so those are features typical of Enchi as well as the banding let me just pull it out and you can see the head is slightly blushed and the lips are white and the snake is very, very yellow. It's uh, very, very bright. You can see it's blushed on the sides. You can see some of the blushing on the sides and also some of the blushing on the dorsal. That's characteristic of pastel. And the Enchi, of course, is the, the banded nature of the, the snake. So you can see the bands here. So there's no alien heads anymore. The alien heads have all gone because of the Enchi. And you can see how lovely and bright and clean that animal is. Now, let me just show you one of... I guess this would be one of his... This is from last year. This is exactly the same snake from last year. So this is a yearling, and this is also a pastel Enchi. So it's exactly the same snake exactly the same snake now you can see as they age you start to get more and more blushing the color has darkened off a little bit but you can see how clean uh, this snake is it does tend to get a little bit muddier on the sides as it grows older so unfortunately guys these baby snakes uh, will change as they age uh, this is a year old version of the same thing so that just gives you a comparison you can see the difference how they grow and develop, but you can see that the pattern is exactly the same on both snakes. And it's the same father. This was produced by him last year. This is now going to be joining the breeding team in about a year's time when she reaches weight. She is eating extremely well. So that is the Pastelenchi, that's also female. 
and just put these back. Give her some water. Now, these snakes have shed out and I will be attempting to feed them for the first time at the weekend. What's my strategy for feeding? Um, don't disturb them. As much as possible do not disturb the snakes. You can see that the snake rag is quite tight, they feel quite secure in there. And what I'm going to feed them for the first few feedings, or attempted feedings, is a live rat pinky. It's alive. Um, I think that stimulates the feeding response. These guys have got millions of years of evolution. They're designed to kill and I think feeding live uses all of the snake's natural senses and they feel a lot more inclined to, uh, to eat live than frozen thawed. I don't want to feed them mice. Um, they will take mice quite readily. Um, but I don't like to feed them mice because they're going to be fed rats for the rest of their life. So if I can get them started on rats, I will. And they won't, have, uh, they won't be eating mice. It can be the absolute devil to get them to switch back to rats if you start them on mice. So I try to avoid that if at all possible. So they'll get live rat pinkies. Um, if they start eating readily, what I'll do with a rat pinky because they can't hurt the snake, they have no teeth. Um, I'll just drop the rat pinky in with the snake and just leave it. Uh, typically if they're going to eat it, they'll eat it fairly quickly. But I'll leave it overnight and check in the morning to see whether they've eaten or not. If they eat, what I do, I keep records of course, but if they eat, I put a little yellow sticker each time they eat on top of the lid of each of my babies. That helps me identify at a glance when the snakes have eaten and when they've not. Rather than have to refer to my book, I can come in here, I can open the snake rack and I can have a quick look at the tubs and I can see exactly which snakes have eaten and which have not. If they won't eat, I'll give them a hide to see whether that helps them to feel more secure. I'll try and avoid that if possible. But these are all little things that you can try to get your snake feeding. As an absolute last resort, if this guy hasn't eaten in about two or three weeks time and it starts to lose weight drastically, I will be forced to feed it a mouse. But I'll try and avoid that at all costs. They'll get rats and they'll get rats for the rest of their life. They grow faster on rats. Uh, rats have more nutritional value and it's very very difficult to get a snake up to size if it's stuck on mice. If you've ever had a ball python that's a mouser and refuses anything else you will know how slowly they grow. So we try and avoid that. Um, once the snake starts to grow on it will move when it outgrows this tub into the next size tub up. So it will go back into a tub of this size. Um, and you can keep the snake up to uh, 150 grams or so, or probably even more in a tub this size. They do feel very secure in a small tub, which is why we start them off in the small tub. And then after they grow out of this tub, they'll move on to my grow on racks here. So this is the, the grow on rack. So we will progress them. You can't move them straight away into a big tub because they will stop eating. Even if you've established them and started to feed them, they'll stop eating if you put them into a big tub straight away. So that's the reason we put them in this small tub. I prefer the small tubs. It's easier to get them to eat. Once they're established, if they're eating uh, rat pinkies, live rat pinkies very well, I will attempt to switch them over to frozen. Um, it's more convenient for me because I have a stock of frozen thawed pinkies in the fridge. I don't have to supply live ones, although I will have my own stock of live pinkies just for these guys. But uh, the sooner we can get them onto frozen thawed, but just for the first few feedings until they're well established, we give them live. So that's it guys. Um, that's the snake set up. We will follow these hatchlings. Uh, through their development. I'll keep notes and uh, I'll show you the results of the, the first feeding. Um, just I do keep a, a written record of all my babies so that's one reason why I don't need to use code words and all the rest of it. I do, I do use a, a notebook. Um, the labels that I use I just bought from uh, Daiso. I use these sticky labels. Daiso or any of the um, 
uh, stationary shops sell these things and the next clutch of babies that I have will just follow on seven eight nine ten so I'll, I'll number them sequentially regardless of which clutch and I obviously I don't have that many snakes so I know what clutch they're from uh, based upon my notes so until I start hatching hundreds of babies that's the system I'm gonna follow they'll all get numbered sequentially uh, my rack holds 30 babies um, Still plenty of room yet, but I have clutches in the incubator and I've got another snake that's uh, due to lay probably today or tomorrow. She's already on day 36 since her pre-lay shed. Uh, so I'm expecting her to lay any day now. She keeps disappointing me. I check every morning, but she hasn't laid yet. So uh, that's it guys. That's the, uh, that's the nice new clutch of uh, babies. We'll follow them as they progress, but they're now set up in their own individual tubs. Um, you've had a good look at what they uh, look like. So that's it for now. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.